Hello, and welcome to the MS for Mama podcast. I'm your host, Abby Halberstadt, happy wife, mama to 10, Bible-believing Christian. And on today's episode, I get to chat with someone who is doing really cool things in the Christian book sphere, and she's going to have a lot of information for every Christian parent, so stay tuned. But before we get started, I want to talk to you about our podcast sponsor, Boatberg Music Academy, not your average music lessons. And they are not your average music lessons because you can do them online. And even though a lot of times music lessons can run into the hundreds of dollars per month for even one child, you rarely pay more than $30 a month and they let you share lessons between siblings, which is amazing. Not only that, but you get 50% off your first month of enrollment using the code Mama at votebergmusicacademy.com. They have lessons in ukulele, fiddle, mandolin, guitar, and piano. They have access to live calls, 24-hour access to your lessons. They even have a vault where if you're ahead of your lessons, you can go in and get more lessons to work on on your own time. You can rewind, you can fast forward. Basically, you can work at your own pace and customize this experience for yourself. There's even badges you can earn along your student success path as you work towards your student showcase, which I love that they are creating a community where you can communicate not only with your instructors, but with other students by playing for them. So if you're interested in giving your students the gift of a lifelong love of music and learning, you can use my code M is for mama for 50% off your first month of enrollment at boatbergmusicacademy.com. And I will put all of that info in the show notes. So today I have Corey Johnson with me on this episode, and she is um, the creator and curator and all the things of the account Good Book Mom on Instagram. And she is here today to talk to us about good books, among other things. Corey, thanks for being here. Hi, Abby. Thanks so much for having me. You're so welcome. Um, Corey, talk to me about how this account started, who you are, kind of your passion and your heart for this topic. Yeah. So Good Book Mom started in 2019. That's when uh, I launched. But Leading up to that, um, I had a firstborn who started reading chapter books very early. And it was sort of like this whole new world of, wait, what are we getting ourselves into? How do I know what's in all these books? And so I started looking for a resource that would give me um, everything I wanted to know from a biblical worldview uh, in a concise manner. And I just didn't find exactly the resource I was looking for. And so after praying about it, talking to my husband, um, we decided that I would just make the resource that I Mm. desired to have as a parent. And um, Good Book Mom launched in November of 2019. So tell me what you, I mean, you mentioned concise biblical viewpoint, but kind of what do you offer as Good Book Mom? Yeah, so Good Book Mom has sort of three levels of um, helping parents. Our first is that we offer free book reviews. Yeah. Um, from a biblical worldview. So if you go to goodbookmom.com and you um, type in a title or an author in the search bar, uh, you can see if we have a review written for um, a book. So and I have totally review. done that. I have totally been like, okay, what does Corey have to say about this book? Oh, is this, is yay, this legit? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're always working hard to get more titles. There's so much. I, right now, the website is zero to 12. Um, I do hope someday to expand to teens, but man, there's a lot of books written for kids zero to 12. So, um, you know, we're trying to add more titles every day. Um, So those are completely free. We also offer a membership, a paid membership, um, where you get access to our book lists. And so these are curated book lists, um, ages zero to 12. Some of them are picture book lists. Some of them are chapter book lists. Some of them are like theology based. I've got Mm. one specifically about kids theology books. I think I titled it kids theology books, good enough for adults. (laughs) Um, so lots of different lists, um, all good book mom approved, um, and reviewed. So everything on those lists has a full review as well. And then the last thing that we offer is a, um, biblical alternative to scholastic book orders. And so it's for discerning schools, co-ops, churches, um, but just families too. It's basically a digital magazine. So anybody can order off of um, our digital magazines. Uh, But if you are an organization, you can earn money back um, to purchase books through 10 of those for your organization. Oh, that is super cool. And it sounds like a lot of work, honestly. Do you have a a decent sized team working for you or is it mostly you? Um, I would say... 
80% of the reviews are written by myself. Um, I do have contributors um, that help me and I can't pay them. <laughs> so yeah. they, they just work for me uh, when they can. They do reviews for me when they can. Um, they're highly vetted. And so um, it's hard to find um, people yeah. who, you know, want to work for nothing to, <laughs> to put in a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, giving biblical uh, book reviews is something that I take very seriously. I know that, um, you know, you need to, to know who you're taking um, uh, advice from and what they believe. And, and so I think that um, being transparent about those things and um, making sure that we are um, just glorifying God through that process, like that's my heart behind all of it. So, I think we live in a day and age where biblical means different things to different people, unfortunately. And so can you kind of talk to me about that process and how you would determine whether a book would meet your standards of biblical excellence and accuracy? Sure. I think the first thing that we have to do is determine what the goal of a book is. Yeah. So if this book is, the goal is to teach my child something theological um, there is a different lens that I'm going to use than if I am, if a book's um, goal is um, just fun, free reading, yeah. if it's yeah. um, fiction that, you know, is a free read. So those have different goals. And so I'm going to view them differently. Um, but when I, regardless, when I'm looking at a book, I want to make sure that um, if it's communicating something about God, that I'm holding scripture up against it and making sure that it aligns with what scripture says. Um, but no matter what kind of book it is, making sure that it doesn't glorify sin. Mm. Um, and we, we, we cannot read books that don't have sin in them. Like that's not a, <laughs> that's not a thing. Right. Um, I, if we're talking about fiction books anyway. Um, and so we have to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're choosing books that are not glorifying sin yeah. um, because we live in a fallen world and there is sin, but the lens through which those things are portrayed is really important. And even though maybe the, the overt message is, Hey, this is a fun book. That's just meant as a free read. Sometimes there is an underlying current of um, a message that they're trying to get across. And so making sure that that message, if there is one, is also being held up to scripture. Yeah, that's so important. Um, I can think of a book that my kids and I were reading recently, and we loved this author's first book so much. And then we got into the second one, and I was kind of determined. Um, there wasn't anything overtly unbiblical about it in many ways, um, because I'm very sensitive to this too. I don't want to say that I love things that are good, right, and true, and scriptural, and then somehow convey the opposite to my children by being like, ah, eh, this is no big deal. You know, we're just going to gloss over this. But we were doing okay so far, except that my kids could not stand the main character because she lied and she did things that were, and you know, of course I'm, I'm hoping this author is going to go somewhere with redemption. You know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to redeem this. We're going to, I'd heard good things about this book. And so I said, well, we're, we're going to try and stick with it and see kind of where this goes. We will have discussions because I think that's so important. I'm sure you do too, yeah. that there are times where sin is presented and maybe there isn't uh, moral spelling out of what that means. And you, the parent, are able to bring the theology in and say, this author doesn't hold a biblical worldview, but we can still look at this and say, um, God's truth is truth no matter what. And how would we, how would we do differently? What do we see that we could work with here? And what do we see that we you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones? Well, we were trying to eat the meat and spit out the bones. And my kids were like, I cannot stand this character because if I knew this person in real life, I would really be concerned for her that she has this habitual act of deception. And, um, and I would be, you know, kind of worried she was lying to me all the time. And so we just dropped the book, you know, it was like, this is not worth it for my kids to see me like determined to finish something that they feel um, really morally uncomfortable with. So we're not, we're not reading that one anymore. It's so, um, but I'm sort of laughing because I think our family read this book that the way you described it, I think we just read this book as well and had the exact same feelings. I'll have to Did ask you make it after. all the way through? Um, I mean, I did because I'm going to review it. <laughs> right. There was, was there redemption? Do I? <laughs> um, 
the the lying was not dealt with. Okay. Um, but there there is a coming together at the end. Okay. Well, and I feel like we're just dancing around this, but honestly, you review books with titles all the time. The first book that I'm talking about is A Place to Hang the Moon. And I yes, absolutely... Yes. Okay. 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 I, I loved A Place to Hang the Moon. And it wasn't That's because, as I. you say, that sin was completely absent. Like there were instances where the kids or the adults absolutely did wrong, but the author did a good job of, I thought, bringing in the acknowledgement of the wrong and the mm -hmm. need for restitution and the need for justice and all those things. And we just weren't getting any of that with the second one. I can't even, the, the, the title of the second one is kind of convoluted. So I never say it correctly. Always only miracles My or something like too. that. Yeah. Something about miracles. I know. I always, yeah. I always mess the title up as well. Yes. No, that's nothing exactly but cool. miracles always something like that. That's so funny that we were talking about the same book. Anyway, I have heard from people that really enjoyed it, that felt like there was redemption. And so I was just going to keep trying. And and sometimes you just kind of have to use the discernment of gauging where your kids are and their ability to interact with that book mm -hmm. and whether it's going to be beneficial to them. It's not necessarily just cut and dried like this is right. This is wrong. This is good. This is bad. Although obviously there is absolute right and wrong. I'm not in some sort of moral ambiguity right. Right. <laughs> thing here. Um, so one of the things that you have really been striving to do in creating this resource is to give alternatives to what is publicly available, right? What's happening in public libraries is that there's not a lot of discernment or the discernment is kind of on the other end of the spectrum in the sense that they are intentionally wanting to present certain kinds of material. Um, and I've heard you talk about this before. Can you kind of speak to that some? Yeah, so the public library, uh, probably any Christian who is a regular or maybe very infrequent attender at their public library likely has seen um, a very hard swing um, in the direction of liberalism in the past 10 years. The, the public library has always been a bit of a more liberal place, but we have seen a very hard turn in the past decade. So just to make sure that we're using clear words, because we're words people, what are you defining as liberalism in this case? Yeah, I would say uh, ideologies that are pushing um, LGBTQ um, Propaganda, I hate, okay, maybe maybe not propaganda is the right word, but but, but, but are pushing LGBTQ ideologies um, and uh, putting forth um, ideas that are clearly anti-biblical. Yeah. So um, that the LGBTQ has been really at the forefront of public libraries in the past five years. Um, but going back to even 10, we have seen um, a pretty hard change where those things used to be um, sort of reserved for the young adult and adult section. And in the past decade, we have seen them just flood the children's market, um, the mm. middle grade and the children's market. With so LGBTQ we are books. Yeah, we are in the very infrequent library category. Um, it's just always kind of been a source of stress to me. I will typically go buy a cheap copy of something I know to be something good that we're going to read a bunch of times. It's going to pass. We have 10 kids in our family. It's going to pass through a bunch of hands. I'll get it from thrift books or buy it cheaply on Amazon. And so I'm tending to, um, vet ahead of time, which is why you're, why what you're doing is so helpful. Um, and then find it cheaply because of the very reason that you're talking about one I don't have a lot of interest in going into a public library setting. Now, we live in a very conservative area in East Texas. We live in a very small town. And so our public library has not followed this route yet, although we have not gone there a lot recently. So they, they could be getting there. But I know the next city over has to the point that the books that are front facing as soon as you walk into the children's section are primarily going to be promoting exactly the kind of values that you're talking about, the agendas that you're talking about. And so that would be one reason why it's kind of made sense for us to back off of that a little bit. And then another would just be that feeling of, um, you know, I'm standing surrounded by books and I feel a little overwhelmed and I have little kids that need to go to the bathroom and you know, all that. So I do find that what you're doing 
is so helpful because I don't have the time to do, I don't have a dedicated account to this. And so we stin, tend to stick with the classics. You know, we're over here with the boxcar children and Little House on the Prairie and Anne of Green Gables and Ramona, although she gets controversial depending on which crowd you're talking to, you know, and and uh, Narnia and, and all these things, which I'm honestly fine with my kids kind of reading those over and over again for the rest of their lives because they are such good literature. Um, would you be able to off the top of your head, this was not a topic that we discussed ahead of time, would you be able off the top of your head to give us your list of favorite classics? Yeah, and I think too, like uh, you, the way that you said that, like the, there's absolutely nothing wrong with sticking with the classics. I think that yeah. our kids, I feel like people can sort of either slide one way or the other where it's like, my kids only read classics yeah, we're, or yeah. um, the other way. And it's like, oh, classics are my kids, you know, don't like those. I'm not going to put them through that. Um, so, and not, you know, it's not one or the other, but there are, um, they're classics for a reason. Yeah. They are beloved for um, generations for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when, when people are, are looking for, literature that is going to stand the test of time as well as teach their children um, sort of develop the palette of good literature for their children i mean you you do need to include the classics yeah um, there's fantastic literature that's being written today however if we only read modern um, authors we won't develop our palette and our children's palette for substantial literature. And um, I mean, even just if we take a look back at Narnia, the, the words, the word structure, the way that he speaks, mm -hmm. the, um, all the text just within, you know, even 50 years, we can see the difference in language. And so yeah. it, is, it is important to make sure that we are including the classics in our children's literary diet. Um, but you don't have to be exclusive to the classic. A lot, actually, several that you said were, were my favorite. I am a huge Narnia fan. Yeah. Um, I know that it can also be controversial, but um, yeah. I love Narnia. And the more that I learn about um, uh, Lewis and Tolkien and um, Dorothy Sayers, I um, am just drawn to them even more. And George MacDonald, um, mm -hmm. any books written by them um, have really rich language, yeah. um, as well as, uh, their desire to, um, in their own way, create art that glorifies God and points to the creator, you know? Yes. Um, and that's, I think the, the highest form of art. Um, and we, we can have that in literature too. And I think that they're really great examples of that. I love that. That idea of everything you do and the Bible says, whether you eat or drink, but you could just keep going with that. You know, what you read, what you write, the art that you create, the meals that you cook, the way that you hug your children, like do it all for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely the goal. So we're talking about this pendulum swing we see toward not even a neutral representation of the kind of literature that's coming out, which you could say that if a library is primarily putting out new offerings than what they're putting out if it tends to promote um, an anti-biblical worldview would be a reflection of the culture. But also, I think you're right that there is a curating happening that is prioritizing those books. Have you seen that? Yeah. So what is happening is that um, librarians, I mean, as much as they tout um, that they're against censorship. The truth is, is that librarians have to make decisions about what yeah. books are going to be in their library. They are the ones that order them. Um, and so what is being ordered in um, is oftentimes at the reflection of a particular librarian, the head librarian, or depending on the size of the system. But a good library should reflect its community. And I think that this is something that a lot of Christians, actually just a lot of people in general, don't actually realize is that a librarian's job um, should be, and, and we're sort of getting away from this a little bit now with librarians, but they are supposed to be a neutral ground. And some yeah. librarians have actively rejected that now, yeah. but- Like almost uh, like librarians as a form of activism. 
Right. Yes. That, that they are the source of information they need to enlighten a culture. Yeah. But you do still have a lot of librarians that um, think that it should be a neutral ground. But what's mm -hmm. happening is that um, to become a librarian, you have to um, go through a program that is certified by the ALA because most libraries won't even look at an application from somebody who, who went to a program that's not ALA. -served. Okay, so the ALA is the American Library Association, which is a very, very liberal organization. And so those programs that they certify um, are reflective of their liberal leanings. And so you have programs to get your master's that include courses in LGBTQ literature. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's no shying away from this in the process of getting your master's. And so one, we have n no biblically solid colleges that offer this master's degree because of the requirements that the ALA has put on right. yeah. this. And we have a lot of Christians fleeing from getting their master's because after they enter the program, they realize that they are being required to leave their biblical worldview at the door. So we have very few Christian librarians. If you have a Christian librarian, <laughs> Just thank them because the environment that they work in, not only after getting their master's, have they been through the ringer. Um, and, you know, beyond, if we're talking 10 years and before, it wouldn't have been quite so bad, but recently, especially. But if you have um, a Christian librarian, their, their environment of work, the ALA still has a lot of say in um, what happens in public libraries and um, all the materials that they offer to public libraries, as well as the school library journal, which is also very liberal. And so um, we just we just don't have a lot of Christian librarians. And that is affecting the books that we see on the shelves in our libraries because the librarians are going through these programs that are basically formed by the ALA and their desire how they want their librarians to look. Wow. Okay. So that gives me so many more layers of the onion peeled back, I feel like, because it has felt a little more like it's probably more of an individual pursuit, but this definitely sounds more organized. I mean, maybe not that people are behind the scenes rubbing their hands together, but as you say, if you're not a Christian, you don't have a biblical worldview, and you truly believe that your job is to quote unquote, enlighten others to, um, a way of thinking that is anti-biblical because for you that you believe that that's the most moral or the most good, then it makes sense that whether you're rubbing your hands together and saying, well, ha ha in the background or not, you are being very intentional with your choices in the same way that we seek to be very intentional with our choices, just for very different goals and with very different standards to start. So I know that there are a lot of parents out there that are thinking, okay, well, I didn't necessarily know about the ALA and I didn't know about the library certification process. And I didn't know about the fact that you kind of have to have a master's and to get that you would have to be denying some of your core principles as a biblical Christian like that. Okay. That makes more sense why this is being pushed so much and why only these types of people are getting in positions of curating these books. But that makes me feel powerless. That, that, like, isn't that a closed loop? then I therefore can't go be a librarian and change the system because I would have to leave my brain, you know, my Christian thinking at the door. So what can we do as parents? Yes, not all hope is lost. I know that sounds like so bleak. <laughs> um, but also it, what is interesting too, before we get to those things we can do is that we, we have people who aren't even believers who are, who are seeing the radical swing of the ALA um, the the head of the ALA is a very outspoken woman who has made some very bold remarks. If you do a Google search on her, um, it'll be interesting. But we have um, we we have states now that are seeing okay, you know maybe we're not pushing Christian morals, but this feels like a really hard swing. Mm -hmm. And there was actually some legislation put on the table in Georgia to require. Um, uh, libraries to separate from the ALA. Now it hasn't gone anywhere yet, um, but we do have even non-Christians sort of seeing this really radical shift in the library. 
And not everyone, even believers, not everyone's on board for that. And so yeah. I am really um, hopeful that more people will um, see that an affiliation with the ALA isn't uh, a necessity for librarians or libraries to um, serve their community well. Um, I'm, I'm is, hoping. Is there some sort of legal requirement now? There is not, no. Okay. Um, but. I mean, it's sort of the trickle down effect. You know, if you have librarians that are in charge of a library who went through an ALA program, they are right. more than likely only going to hire ALA certified right. people. Um, so it, it's it's a domino effect. But um, but Georgia pushed back pretty hard saying we're going to make. We're going to make it so you can't be associated with them. It's still, mm. it's kind of been shelved. It's only been a month, but I'm hoping that um, it's at least stirs the pot a little bit in that direction. But not all hope is gone. Um, there are lots of things that as believers we can do to um, have an effect in our public libraries for the glory of God. So the, the most important thing we can do, which is time consuming, but it really will affect every other tip that I am going to give you um, is to form a relationship with your librarian. Mm -hmm. And I know that that can seem daunting and hard, especially if they are very outspoken about their worldview and it's very different than yours that can feel challenging. But um, this is going to help you not only help your experience at the library become better. But if you have that relationship with your librarian, then when there are things that you have um, concerns about, talking to them, if you have an established relationship, bringing concerns to them and talking to them as a human being, um, as an image bearer is going to go a lot farther than seeing them as the enemy. And, yeah. you know, that we have to slay them, we don't battle against flesh and blood. Um, right. And we have to remind ourselves of that because it's yeah. very easy to sort of get, you know, worked up when we see something at a library and make our voice heard. But we do need to remind ourselves really that our librarians are image bearers that need the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and I so forming a relationship, yeah. yeah, forming a relationship with your librarian is um, the biggest, most important tip that I can give you. And speaking from personal experience, my I have a very, very small library. Um, but I have, I, there's only two full-time librarians and they have both, uh, very different worldviews than I do, but I, I love them both so much. I'm, mm -hmm. I am intentional about when I go into the library about connecting with them. And if you feel like you have nothing that you can talk to them about, um, bring a book, find a book on the shelf from your library that you like and bring it to them and say, I just love this book. Do you have other titles like this? And bond over yeah. books. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, having a relationship is, um, it is something that takes time, but uh, it's, it's worth it um, in the long run. I love that. I love that example. And, and the humanizing so that it's image bearers over issues yes. is so important, but that's not just limited to books and libraries. Obviously this is yes. true. We need to be seeing people as um, desperately in need of the gospel, but also as people that God created and who bear his image. Yeah. I just, I love that. So tell us about some other tips. Tell us some things that we can do to be proactive, but not obnoxious. Cause I feel like that's where you're going with this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So there's really easy things that you can do. So the, the first thing is that uh, checkouts are really the lifeblood of library books. If books are not being checked out, they will eventually be pulled from the shelves through a process called weeding. And librarians will usually yearly go through the books and, and take out the ones that haven't been checked out and either sell them or what, however they dispose of their books. Um, and so if you have books at the library that are good, check them out. Mm. And I would say, even if you don't have time to read them at that moment, whenever yeah. I go to the library, I always intentionally grab another book or two that I know I won't have time to read that time, but I want another checkout to count towards that book. That's such a great idea. Because that just keeps them there. It's yeah. it, and, and oftentimes when you renew a book, like um, lots of people can do that online. 
if you have to renew a book, that does count usually for another checkout for a oh, book. Oh, nice. Okay. Good to know. So super easy. Um, another one would be that a lot of libraries offer patron requests. Not all libraries, but many libraries have built into their budget money to purchase books that are requested by patrons. Yes. Um, people tell me all the time that they've requested my books for a library and then they go and they get them. So they're like, I'm the reason your book is in my library. And I'm like, oh, that's so yes. cool. Yes. That, so, and the thing is too, like you, you can request overtly Christian titles. Yeah. Um, like we talked about before, your library is supposed to be a reflection of your community. And so if you are requesting those titles, even if, even if um, your library doesn't have a policy, there are some libraries that say we don't have the budget. We can't offer that. Yeah. If you are letting your librarian know, oh, this is the kind of book that I would like. And if you're not the only one kindly letting them know that, um, it should influence what they are purchasing. I feel uh, like what I you might be... I feel like what you might be suggesting is like, like, um, like book requesting parties, <laughs> like, like, like get with your, get with your small group or your homeschool group and decide like the kind of books that you would love your library to feature and then coordinate to all requests. I feel like that would be impactful. Maybe like what is going on, but I think it would, you know, ping the system at the very least. Actually. So I have like a mini course, um, that I'm giving away for free for Christian book month, which is April. And that is basically one of my tips is that um, if you have other believers that use your same public library, you can um, form a little text group or something where you can say like, hey, this this book is here. Check it out. Make sure it gets checkouts or I'm yeah. going to request this book, you know, just like you said, um, and letting each other know the good books that are there and the books to stay away from. Um, so this one I learned from my friend Anne Say, but if there is a book, oh I on, love Anne, I do love Anne. She's so wonderful, and she has a heart for this too. But this is such a great tip. I have often heard people when they see, especially picture books, it usually happens with they see a picture book that is pushing um, agendas that don't align with a biblical worldview, and so they take it and they slip it somewhere else in the mm -hmm. library. They um, put it somewhere so that a child won't see it. And as much as I understand that sentiment and um, and support the idea of not exposing our children to those things, that's actually not how we wanna proceed at the library. And there's a couple of reasons. First, when that book is found, it actually counts as an in-house checkout. Uh, if oh, a book is moved- interesting. Yeah, if it's moved and found in the place where it's not supposed to be, um, it counts as a checkout because it shows that somebody was interested enough to pick that book up and move mm, it. Okay. So it's it's counting for a checkout. If you hide it so well that they can't find it, many libraries will order another. And so then they will eventually have two copies. Yeah. Uh, but finally, finally, we we want to be um, honest in our dealings yeah. Yeah. at the library. We don't want our librarians to um, say, oh, what's going to disappear now that they're here? Uh, right. You know, we want to be honest and um, and bring those concerns to our librarian uh, instead of trying to be sneaky about it. I love that. And and the the idea that you may not like the property that they're displaying, but it's not your property ultimately. Right. So yes, yes. I love that. Of that. You mentioned Christian book month. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So last year, good book mom started Christian book month uh, with a twofold goal. First um, to encourage believers during the month of April to read a book that's written by another believer. Um, it's not Bible reading month because every day should be Bible reading day. You know, like it's, <laughs> yeah. that's it's yeah. the Bible, everything falls under scripture. And so this month is just to, if you don't normally read outside of your um, Bible reading time to encourage believers to read something, either fiction or nonfiction, but there's so many solid titles written by believers. Uh, so to encourage believers to read something either independently or to get a book club uh, read something intentionally with your children during that month, but read something written by a Christian during the month of April. I love that. And then the other um, 
goal for Christian Book Month is to encourage believers to be active in their public library. And do, I mean, just doing what we're talking about, what we're doing right now, um, just informing other believers how they can really easily make an impact at their public library and not to do it just in April. The, the goal is April yeah. reminds us, OK, this is this is how we do these things. Let's teach other people about it so we can do it all year long and really influence our public library. I love those goals. I feel like you are giving such a. a warm, holistic approach to this rather than simply, I feel like um, I shy away from terms like activism because there's such an association with a militant mindset, with a hostile attitude. And that's not who we're called to be as believers. We are called to let our light so shine before men that they glorify our God in heaven, our father in heaven. And so these are really light shining, honest ways to do this that are full of integrity. And I think they're going to be really encouraging to parents who feel really lost on how to turn the tide and change the narrative in our culture. Um, I can think of so many books that I read growing up that were not written by explicitly Christian authors, but were still full of God's truth. And so I think both you and I would agree that this is not necessarily about only promoting um Christian authors, so they get the royalties or, you know, anything like oh, yeah. it, so much as it is, um, it's not about circling the wagons so much as it is about being discerning and saying, what do we want to present to our children as literature that will reinforce what we are talking about each day as we fulfill Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8 to talk about God's ways and impress them upon our children as we lie, sit, walk and stand. And one of those ways would be by going to the library. Yes. And what an example to your children, too. If, if you do choose to bring your children to the library, I would always press, you know, prepare them um, if they haven't been that, you know, the library is a collection of books that is not collected by Christians. And so there are going to be books at the library that mom and dad uh, don't want to bring into our home because they are teaching things that don't align with scripture. And so preparing them before you go so yeah. that they know, but then them being able to see you interact with likely uh, people who have a very different worldview than you do uh, in a respectful, loving and caring way, um, you know, pointing them to Christ uh, when possible. Um, I mean, I feel like that is such a testament to our kids, too, that that we don't we don't need to flee from those things that we can have. Um, an effect for Christ, even in some place like the public library. I love that perspective. Corey, thank you so much for taking the time to educate us and encourage us toward truth. Thank you for taking the time with Good Book Mom to do all of that research for us and reviewing that a lot of us feel really overwhelmed and like we don't have the time to do. I appreciate your answering that calling from the Lord to tackle something that is probably feels kind of daunting sometimes and yet I think is so worthwhile. Um, where can our listeners find you? Yes, you can find me at Good Book Mom on Instagram and Facebook, as well as my website, goodbookmom.com, where you can find our free book reviews. You can find information about our membership and our book order, as well as the free mini course that I am giving away for Christian Book Month. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, and I hope you have an awesome day. Thanks so much for having me, Abby. You're so welcome. If you enjoy the MS for Mama podcast, I would be so honored if you would subscribe and follow along, maybe share with friends or even leave a review. And if you want more content on motherhood and biblical responses to cultural issues, be sure to follow along on Instagram at m.is.or.mama.